please welcome to the stage Professor Christian Ottensmeyer. Well, 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 Maybe may reserve the applause for afterwards if I've said something useful. But well, thank you very much. Um, so I, uh, when I agreed to give this talk, I thought, oh, this is really quite interesting um, and quite provocative. But when I started preparing the talk, I realized what a poison challenge this, uh, this, this actually is. So uh, trying to come up with an answer, limited option, does that mean no choice? Um, is a question that does rare mean no choice, is a question that I'm going to try and, and think through with you because I think the answer is it doesn't mean that there is no choice, but with a big but attached. So let me take you through, um, uh, through my thinking. I'd be really interested to, to hear what you think about uh, what I've made out. So uh, I, I started off by working out what is rare. Um, so it turns out that lots of people understand lots of different things by rare, and I was quite surprised, actually, how, un how common rare is. Um, so rare diseases in the United States and the EU are anything that is less than 50 patients per 100,000. So, um, so if you think about um, uh, 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 65 million people in the UK, you multiply that by 10, so 500 times 65 comes, at, um, uh, comes at up about 3,000 patients per year. So in oncology terms, that doesn't feel very rare. Um, and that means that there are about 7,000 diseases that are thought to be rare. That accounts for about 8% um, of people. And 60 million people have rare diseases in the United States and the EU alone. So clearly, there are lots of different pots, all with very small numbers, but that account for a really big problem. And I thought I'd put it into context of something that's really common. So uh, I, was, I was mulling over the, the colors that I was choosing. And I thought, well, have I picked red and green the right way? So I thought, well, let's have a look at what color blindness comes up with. And, and that accounts for 2.5 million people in the UK, so roughly 4,000 events per 100,000. So that's about 100 times as much as this. Now, if we think about cancer, and that is really, of course, what I was supposed to be talking about, then, uh, then rare cancers are usually thought to be um, events that um, happen less than two in 100,000. So if you were to take that into the UK, that's about 1,300 patients a year. Um, and uh, so if you can think, compare that to melanoma overall, uh, which is about 15,000 patients a year, so then you understand melanoma is not falling to the pot of rare, uh, but is actually a, a relatively common tumor. And so if we then look at cancers worldwide, and I, I found these numbers really quite instructive. I'd never really thought about the problem like this. Then there are about 15, 14 million cancers that are diagnosed annually worldwide. Um, in the UK alone, uh, that's about 360,000, so about 550 per 100,000. This is the sort of number that I kept coming across and again and again. And I couldn't quite really work out what it meant until I started translating it into real people who would be affected, say, in the UK. So that leaves us with melanoma as the fifth common cancer, fifth most common cancer, with about 15,000 patients uh, presenting each year. And of course, only a small minority, about 10% of these patients, present with really advanced disease. So actually, the most of the patients who are diagnosed with melanoma uh, get away with and, and, and never have any problems later on. Uh, but that still leaves, out of these 15,000, roughly 2,000 who die annually, um, uh, 2,500 who die annually of melanoma. So that's still quite a large number of deaths that we are currently not able to solve. But then when you get into the, the rare melanomas, then that actually accounts for much, much smaller numbers. And, and I've sort of total these up um, in, in decreasing order of frequency. And I've picked out ocular melanoma or uvel melanoma, uh, which accounts for about 600 cases a year, so about 4% of the total. Um, acral antigenous melanoma, a particular subtype of skin melanoma, accounts for about 300. Mucosal melanoma, melanomas of, for example, the nose or the, uh, the vulva, so internal organs, is another about 300. And then you're really starting to see uh, very few patients who suffer and present with conjunctival melanoma. So if you think that the, the trial that we, we spoke about, um, or that we have had presented, recruited in, I think, 20 countries, uh, recruited um, in about 150 centers, and recruited just short of 1,500 patients, then you can imagine if you wanted to do something like that in, in a disease of which that in the UK there are only 30 per year, you'll never be able to deliver that. 
So then, then, then you come to a tricky problem. So if you can't do large trials, well, uh, how, how do you make decisions? And I, I, I know that you've already heard about uh, the sort of types of trials, at least randomized trials, but I thought it might be helpful to sort of just spell out once more what sort of degrees of evidence one might be able to use in order to figure out what we should do. So there's a person who comes to see a physician and says, I've got the following problem, what am I supposed to do? And, and so the most robust assessment are these randomized trials. And, and while, um, uh, while they, they take a stand of care treatment, so the best we can currently do, and then the hope is that, that, will, uh, that the control treatment, or the, the, uh, the treatment that is actually under investigation, will turn out to be better. And we assume that that will bring us right uh, closer to the right answer. And we also assume that there is a right answer, because the right answer may be something that varies over time, varies, for example, between different um, ethnic populations, maybe um, uh, varies over whatever you do to yourself, such as things like food or what is going on in, in your bowel in terms of the mycobacteria. So the, the trick that we're trying to solve is how to get as close to that right answer as we possibly can. And Lucinda uh, told us really beautifully about the, the risks and hazards ratios, which are the tools that we in the clinic try to, 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 to translate into manageable, uh, into treatment decisions, uh, sometimes correctly and sometimes incorrectly. Because it also turns out that even if you do randomized trials, you sometimes get it wrong. So, for example, in, 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 uh, in lung cancer treatment, there was a big story about two drugs that we also use in melanoma, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, um, and, and they, they have been through lots of different trials with quite conflicting results. So um, nivolumab, which is now a standard in melanoma, standard in lung cancer, standard indeed in many solid tumors, um, has just suffered a huge blow because they've had uh, two trials in, in, in lung cancer patients that apparently showed no benefit. So that's, everybody's now scratching their heads and thinks, well, how can this drug that so patently works can give you a trial result that is so patently con inconsistent with what else is going on? And I think the, the answer is that the trial is an attempt to get to the right answer, but doesn't give you the definitive answer. So for us as physicians, I think we also need to be aware of that because we, we, we tend to be brought up by the trial as the only really evidence that we can use. But if Excuse me, but of course that evidence is still flawed and is not really the definitive answer, just as close as we can get. And one of the key issues here is to try and get away from selection bias, both the patients and the doctors. So um, I've been in, in oncology for many decades now, and it is very clear that lots of interesting new products come along and then look really great when they're first tested in people. And then when you try and do the same study again in another center or between centers, you then find actually it's nowhere near as good as people initially thought. And that's an example of, of selection bias. For example, if you are in the US and you go to Memorial Sloan Kettering Institute and you live in the other side of Texas, well, then it takes you maybe five hours to get to your center, and you need to be well enough to achieve that. So these biases are very real, and particularly the case when, when drugs or new drugs that look interesting are only available in selected places. The other um, issue is that physicians sometimes have prejudices about what they should do with their patients. And, and Pippa discussed the dilemma that we have, um, for example, between BRAF inhibition or immunotherapy, where we know that what well, is pretty unlikely that you'll cure the patient with a BRAF inhibitor, but you may have a chance for doing that with immunotherapy, but at the cost that the treatment doesn't work so well. So I think the key issue here is trials remain the estimate, not the absolute truth. Um, and they, of course, and that came up in the last question, it only reflects the patients that are rolled in the study at the selection point. So um, people who are well or have no brain myths, we've heard the, the point earlier. That doesn't mean that any other evidence is irrelevant. So, uh, for example, there are non-randomized trials, trials that just examine a treatment. Um, they measure the effect and, of course, often the side effects of a treatment. And I think they have a higher chance of being wrong, so away from this absolute true, correct answer, just because there is a selection bias of who goes into the study, who is included, who may, uh, may choose to not participate for whatever reason, good or bad. 
Um, and they also um, reflect uh, choices of patients that the f physician offers the uh, study to. So this bias is much more controlled in a study where the physician makes no decision. At least you can get away from that particular. And finally, uh, there's of course the possibility to just look what at, has, at what has happened. So that's the sort of real life data collection. How have we treated patients in the UK or wherever, and what is the final outcome? And often we find that it, is, it maps really well onto, um, onto what has been reported in the trials, but uh, occasionally it doesn't map so well. So what happens then if there are no trials in, in the really rare cancers? So I, I suspect that there will never be a trial, for example, in conjunctival melanoma that will get anywhere close to being a randomized study. Well, we can be led by the name, and particularly in melanoma land, that, that's a really, um, a, a really pervasive problem. So for example, we call melanoma things that start in the eye, things that start in the skin, things that start in the conjunctiva, so the lining of the eye, or in the inner, inner linings, for example, of the nose and of the ear. And they all make, are derived from pigment-making cells, melanomas, melanos meaning black, and oma meaning lumps. Uh, but actually, they're, they're not really the same thing. They just have the same name. And, and, and in terms of treatment decisions, that is really difficult then, because if you call cattle and horses the same thing, then you might think that you get milk from both, and of course, you might be quite surprised. <laughs> So one example here is that uh, if you have uvular melanoma, then um, we use all the drugs that, uh, that we use in skin melanoma um, where appropriate, so ipilimumab, nivolumab, pembrolizumab. And we, we thought initially, fantastic, we can give this stuff to, to people who we've had nothing useful for. And we've learned, actually, it doesn't work, even remotely as well. And so I think the melanoma um, is, a, is a real red herring in this, and, and it's clearly a very different disease. Um, however, other examples, such as conjugate tidal melanoma at the very rare end of the spectrum, um, it turns out to have BRAF mutations, just like skin melanoma, um, roughly slightly lower percentage, but it spreads much more like skin melanoma, and we treat it much more similarly, and occasionally quite successfully uh, with BRAF inhibitors. So um, I think the message here is be cautious about the names, because it's really about the biology. So what if there are no trials? And I guess, uh, you know, from, from an um, academic oncologist perspective, um, my, my take is, well, we need to generate the evidence. We need to push the trials. But I think we need to do trials that actually patients want to participate in and that physicians think answer the right questions. And increasingly, it is also clear uh, that the patients who come to our clinics actually have really good ideas about what the right questions are. So we should sort of cull all that, um, uh, all, all, all that expertise and bring that together and to bear on this problem. And clearly, we need to learn about the biology. So this is when it now gets really hairy. Um, so I'm going to teach you a little bit of uh, molecular biology, I hope. So let me give you some basic terminology. So the terms that we need to, to know are the genome, the transcriptome, the proteome, and peptidome. They all have the ohm bit in, in common. Ohm basically means everything of the same sort of flavor. So the genome um, and c contains all, um, all this stuff in our body that is encoded in a specific molecule called DNA. So if you take this into, a, uh, into an analogy, and, and, and I like cooking, so I tend to use cooking analogies quite a bit. So then this would be the, the recipes the cells in our body can cook from. So that's the cookbook with all the recipes nicely ordered. The next one down the line is a transcriptome. Um, and this is made out of, so the transcribed, the genes are made into RNA. This, is, this process is called transcription. So the transcriptome is all the molecules that our body makes from the genes. So it's kind of, kind of clever. So you don't take your cookbook into the kitchen. You make a copy of the recipe and take that into the kitchen. So this copy, this working molecule, is RNA. So if you think about it then, the RNA will tell you all the things that the cells are currently cooking, all the recipes they're cooking from. So they tell you what the cells are doing. So this is what the cell can do, and this is what the cell does do. And then the next one down is the proteome. That's the, the dishes that are being served in the cell. So these are the molecules, the proteins, that actually do the doing. So when you look at someone's face, you see the skin and the keratinocytes. That's made out of protein. So that's the stuff that makes most of us up. 
And these are the functional molecules. So uh, imagine these as dishes served. So, however, these we can read quite easily now. So that's sort of uh, standard technology. And you can take that from a whole tumor down to a single cell and read all the genes and all the transcriptomes, all the RNA that the cells are making. And we're not yet very good at reading all of these proteins, although that's getting better also. And finally, you know, imagine the dish has now been eaten. There's the stuff left over. You clear up the table. That's the stuff that's left on the plates. That's the peptidone, the degraded product. And this is what our immune cells um, sort of look, at for the, uh, look for in the body. So the immune cells try and find the debris from the proteins that are being um, ready to be reused. So our body doesn't throw the proteins when, when, when they're old or when they're no longer working. It sort of chops them into little bits, and you reuse all the kit. So then, um, now, if you now take the, uh, the, the terminology, the genome, the transcriptome, the proteinome, and the peptidome, all of these give you different levels of information of what's going on in a cell. And of course, you can levy all of that to look in cancer cells, or healthy cells, or maybe comparatively. And, and so that is becoming really quite straightforward. Um, so, for example, when we talk about a BRAF mutation, then we look at whether this, in this level, the gene for the BRAF gene the B RAF gene, there, uh, there's also an N RAF, and there are various flavors of RAF genes. Um, the B RAF gene is the one that is most commonly damaged in melanoma cells. So you're looking at this level. You're asking, has the cookbook got an error in the recipe for B RAF that sells, tells the melanoma cell to, to, to work independent, uh, independently on this B RAF mutation? So, and we do that for melanoma a lot, so everyone who comes with melanoma, uh, at least of the skin, will get their tumor tested for BRAF mutations because in half of the patients, roughly, uh, we, we then have a treatment. The cancer cells love this pathway and they need it to thrive, and so when you block that, that food, then the cancer cells keel over and die. Um, finally, we can look at what cells, the, gene, what the genes the cells use, so RNA and the proteins and the immune cells that are seeing the debris that's worked out. So now we, we, we have, um, let's assume we've done all of that. And so then, then we still don't really know what to do with the data. But yet you now begin making comparisons. You can ask, well, if you, for example, have a melanoma with BRAF mutation, what would happen if you had another cancer that also has a BRAF mutation? So, for example, thyroid cancer turns out to have BRAF mutations quite often, or hair cell leukemia, lung cancer, and bowel cancer. But it turns out not all BRAF mutations are born equal. So in thyroid cancer and hair cell leukemia, and actually in lung cancer, um, BRAF inhibitors work quite nicely, uh, really well in hair cell leukemia. But for example, on their own, they don't work at all well in bowel cancer. So I think this is, begins to elicit why we need trials, because the extension from a thought process sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work. And that's clearly no good if you're a, an individual patient with an individual problem. You really don't want to be the person where it doesn't work. You'd really rather like to have the drug that actually does make your cancer better. And, and so we, we do realize that we live in a time of unprecedented change. Um, and, and, and I've sort of, this is my, my standard slide of cancer immunotherapy, just looking at anti PD1, anti PD ligand 1 antibodies. And I've listed a lot of tumors where these drugs have been tested. And anti PD1 on its own sort of sits in a um, control rate of about 30%. And if you give IPI and NEVO together in many cancers, um, we are now hitting the sort of 50% range. And, and that is also, for example, in cancers where we previously made no, um, no, no impact so with lung cancer. And so it does begin to now say that cures are possible, doing the same thing in different settings. So maybe here the extension is valid. Uh, and we're now in the era of the monoclonal antibodies or the MUBs. And, but our cho choices are still by and large random. And, and we're still really poor at picking uh, what we should do for an individual patient. We can, of course, treat everybody, which is what we did in the melanoma trials. But we need to get better so that we just treat the 50% who will actually benefit. But I think that process of unraveling is beginning to also ex um, explain why these same drugs might work, for example, I don't know, in conjunctival melanoma or, um, or indeed not work in uval melanoma. Because ultimately, this is all about balance. Um, immune suppression, if the cancer is um, active, the net result is uh, that the cancer grows. And if you you activate the immune system, then you kill the cancer because the T cells, the immune cells, eat it. And so these slides we've already seen in, in real curves where we're sort of pushing up the, uh, the response rates over time. And it's also turning, becoming very clear that cancer isn't just cancer. 
cancer, we sort of, I thought of when I became an oncologist, thought, well, cancer, that's the cancer cells, surely. But actually, it isn't. Um, it's, it's, it's the cancer cells, yes, but there's lots of other stuff in the cancer cells also. And that is from cells that have a, a, have a job in, in, in their life to hold things together. They're called stromal cells. They make all the glue that sticks our cells together. Oh, and then there are, of course, the immune cells, and particularly these ones, the CD8 T cells, which are the guys who, who do the killing and that I'm particularly interested in. And so I think one of the tools that is becoming um, applied, and the, the, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Institute just generated a paper on 20,000 patients worth of, of gene sequences in which they've done this sort of thing, so I'm a little bit ashamed that I can only show you 40 or so, um, is when you start looking at the, um, the immune genes, and these are the genes that we can target, and um, you don't really need to read the individuals other than these are the markers for, for um, T cells that are working, and you can see that there are some that are red, in other words, hot, and some, some that are blue, in other words, cold. And that terminology uh, comes, from this, uh, comes from this kind of slide. And actually, it doesn't matter very much. So these, the purple ones are lung cancers that are resected. The green ones are immune cells, just the same kind of immune cells, which are from advanced cancers, metastatic, lung, and melanoma, and there's a uh, neuroendocrine tumor. And you can start unraveling that actually the features of the immune cells are really very much conserved between cancers cancers and really independent of whether you've got early or late cancer. So suggesting that this kind of information, looking at the transcriptor and what the cells are actually cooking from, can give you a hint of what the patient might do if you give them an immunotherapeutic. So we're, of course, now developing this systematically, and we'll see whether our guesses are right. But for what it's worth, these two patients on the very left have had a complete remission, um, and the cancer hasn't come back. In, in, in this is a gentleman with metastatic lung cancer and a lady with metastatic melanoma. They're now both over two years out. Uh, and this patient had no response whatsoever, suggesting that there is some important information contained therein. So one other issue that, that might become quite intriguing is then if you think about the cookbooks, the recipes in the cancer cells, not as the information that the cancer cell wants to use, but as something that we might be able to exploit. So it turns out that lots of cancers have lots of mutations, and uh, this is a very famous slide by now that's coming out of this Nature paper, uh, where the group has sort of ordered the, the uh, individual cases by how many mutations they could find in the cancer cells. And, and they're, they're, they're labeled in um, number per million, per million bases. And you can see that there's a wide range from uh, tumors that have lots of mutations at the right end, so melanoma, and tumors that have very few. But it, it is now possible to read these, and therefore we might be able to, for example, exploit these in making a vaccine. So one of the tools that is being tested is if you read out all these genes and analyze them compared to the genes in the healthy, uh, healthy cells, work out that difference, and then read which ones of these the cells are actually cooking from, you might be able to read out what you might want to put into a vaccine to educate the immune system. So when I started in immunology, um, which is now about 15 years ago, this seemed like science fiction. You know, oh, you never can do that. It's a nice exercise. But now the first trials are running. Um, and the first trials are recruiting, doing this systematically, and it's possible to make a vaccine in about eight weeks. Um, so it is therefore now becoming possible that you say, take my lung cancer uh, and sequence the hell out of it and work out what kind of vaccine we should make. So I think that that kind of process where you sort of make a string of beads of such a vaccine um, construct will give you the opportunity to, to, to sequence the tumor and make a bespoke treatment which you could give while the cancer's disappeared to prevent it from coming back, or indeed give it as a treatment when the cancer has come back. So that might be one way in which we could overcome the sort of difficulties of having people with rare tumors, because this no longer relies on the rarity of the tumor, but just on the genes that are found in that patient's cancer. And then actually each individual patient becomes an individual case and an individual, uh, an individual immunological problem. So therefore, I think the, the, the future for cancer therapy and immunotherapy is to pick the right drug for the right patients, optimize the existing drugs, position new drugs, and there are tens of them coming through. Um, and we're, I think, going to be seeing more and more of these personalized vaccines which turn 
tumors from these blue immune code, immune hot tumors. And for then coming back to the purpose of my talk, um, does rare mean no choice? I think, no, it does not. Um, so it's becoming increasingly obvious that we can make choices. Clearly, it remains a problem because it means more uncertainty. So I think my plea is to push the understanding of the biology. We need to collect the tissue for from the patients. That's what contains all the information about the cancer. And we need to collect outcome data, not just in one center, but between centers. Um, and so there's an ongoing effort, for example, in melanoma um, to start doing that. And we need to push, setting, push towards setting up trials where we don't have them yet. Um, so, and work with our statisticians to help figure out how we can do this, get to the answer, the most robust answer, not the perfect answer, just the most robust answer that allows us to make treatment decisions with the fewest numbers of patients. So that's my answer to does re mean no choices. Thank you very much. <laughs>